Thanks so much to everybody who's here joining us live tonight. We have three incredibly experienced and knowledgeable BC alumni here who are eager to chat live with you all about the state of American politics. Before we dive in, I just want to note that the BC Media Alumni Network is not sponsored by nor affiliated with Boston College. So any views expressed during this event don't necessarily reflect the views of the university nor uh, the BC Media Alumni Network. Just have to put that disclaimer out there. And final note before we start is please feel free to use the live chat and the Q&A functions here to ask your questions and make your voice heard during the conversation. I think what's so uh, fun about our events is that we really encourage you to write in, share your thoughts, share your questions, and, and really receive the unique opportunity to chat live with our esteemed guests tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Jill Alper is president of Alper Strategies and Media. She is a nationally recognized strategist and consultant, former political director of the DNC, and she is a veteran of seven presidential races, including as a national electoral strategist for Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, and Al Gore. The American Association of Political Consultants honored her work for Jennifer Granholm as Campaign Manager of the Year, which is a recognition often given to presidential campaign managers and seldom given to women. So congrats on that incredible award, Jill, and welcome. Also with us tonight is Candy Stroud, who is president of Stroud Communications. Candy is a best-selling author and the first woman chief diplomatic correspondent for CNN. As the DNC's National Director of Radio Communications, Candy arranged over 55,000 earned media interviews with the highest level Democratic officials and produced massive media, uh, massive media events for five Democratic national conventions. She has worked on several presidential campaigns, including Gore for President in 1988, Clinton for President in 2008 and 2016, Obama-Biden 2008-2012, and many others. And last but certainly not least, Bob Vanoss is here, and he is principal of Stoveboat Communications, a media and public relations firm with a concentration in oceans and fisheries regulation. Bob was a Republican leadership staff member in the U.S. House of Representatives, and then in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, worked as the politics editor at AOL News and as editor-in-chief at Voter.com. He's worked with the U.S. military, the White House, foreign heads of state, and numerous private clients. I tried to shorten the bios and, and give you all the credit you're all, you all deserve without going on for too long. <laughs> so appreciate everybody uh, listening there. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight uh, for this conversation. Thank, Thank you. So you. All right, so we'll start to talk about election 2020. Election 2020 had a record voter turnout, as we all know. Um, besides the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, what, what are the factors that you see that attributed to this massive turnout? And do you think that this level of turnout can actually be repeated in four years from now? Well, if, if, if you'd like me as the senior to start, <laughs> the senior correspondent here, I, I would have to say that there was a, <clears throat> for the Democrats, there was a passionate loathing of Donald Trump. Democrats would have crawled over broken glass to get to the polls to vote for Joe Biden. Um, uh, conversely, uh, the Republicans had a passion, uh, passionate love for Donald Trump, witnessed the 57,000 people who turned out in Butler, Pennsylvania for his rally, witnessed the 96 mile long car parade, I think it was in Florida, uh, things like that. I mean, the, 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 the planes that went overhead, they, there was a tremendous love for uh, Trump. And there was also a lot of fear um, of the, the, the messages that were being put out. Um, like they were afraid of Joe Biden raising taxes. They were afraid of the problems with Antifa, Black Lives Matter, the burning, the looting. Um, they didn't like the messages on fracking in Pennsylvania, um, and uh, they were very worried about us, the, the term socialism and Marxism. And, um, and, and, and I think that in terms of the Democratic Party, there was an enormous, uh, uh, brilliant campaign done in terms of organization um, that has been worked on for a long time, and it was so different. I'm sure Jill will agree with this in terms of it being a, a virtual, I'm talking too long because I want to give this to, to Jill to, to address, but this virtual campaign was very, very, very successful. 
and it was very personal, even though there wasn't door to door campaigning. And we can go into that in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you've said, Candy. I double down on that. I mean, highest turnout in 100 plus years, I think 120 years. Uh, the pandemic itself certainly um, inspired some to turn out on either side, don't want to wear a mask, don't want to be sick, what's the president doing? Uh, the idea that it was easier to vote, many states taking extra uh, extra steps in Michigan, we were actually where I live, um, also implementing a ballot proposal that had passed a couple years ago that made it easier to vote. People can vote at early vote centers. They can vote no reason absentee, we call it. Uh, so there were expanded voting options for folks. The partisanship, the hyper-partisanship, um, which Candy really teased out beautifully. And, and then just sort of the social pressure of the conversation itself, um, both parties in their own ways were, were really using or orchestrating this person-to-person -person conversation, you know, campaigning because of uh, COVID really uh, changed in some ways, relational organizing being used um, in a much more serious way by both parties to incite um, participation. So, so many more things to say. Um, Bob, are you, are you picking up what we're laying down or? I don't actually agree that Republicans across the board were passionate about Donald Trump. In fact, I think Republicans were very divided about Donald Trump, even, even conservative Republicans. I think that um, I do agree that there was a, well, there were two things. I mean, first of all, I mean, I received a ballot in the mail without asking for one. So obviously uh, there was a tremendous effort to allow people to vote in ways that had never been done before. Uh, but I do think there was something that I found a little bit disconcerting, which was on both sides an almost religious passion uh, particularly on the left. I think Candy described that pretty well, not in those terms, but the degree to which people uh, equated um, the, you know, a vote against Donald Trump as a moral, uh, a, a moral uh, eth you know, ethos, a moral thing to do, I think was, was quite something. And I don't think that there are, you know, 71 million misogynist racists in the country. Um, I don't think everybody who voted for Donald Trump um, is a racist. I think there were people who legitimately had concerns. I mean, I think Candy raised some of the fear mongering, but I mean, I think there were legitimate concerns. Um, you know, a CNBC poll just came out saying that two thousand of two thousand small business executives who are concerned about a Biden administration, um, and and small business owners are among the one of the few groups that's really strongly concerned. I would say that's probably because many small business owners are among the people who you know were promised if they liked their uh, their policy, they could keep it, and then they weren't able to. And a lot of small business owners found their insurance went up tremendously because they were no longer able to select a higher deduct, uh, deductible. They had to select $2,500 deductible. So the cost of providing health care to small business has been a, a real problem. And there were you know, other things that, um, that, that, that were done uh, under the Obama administration that I think were a significant problem for some, um, some, some particular businesses. I mean, for example, and I'll make this really, I'll make this quick, I don't want to go on too long, but for example, the work that we do in oceans and fisheries, if you look at the map of Massachusetts, New Bedford, where I grew up, uh, voted for Trump. Well, you know, I don't think that's because New Bedford is a particularly racist place. In fact, with the Portuguese community there, there's more, you know, Cape Verdeans of African and, 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 and Portuguese of European descent. But there was a lot of concern about the Atlantic Marine Monument that um, was created that harmed the fishing industry. Mm -hmm. Even Senator Warren, you know, said that 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 that, uh, that 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 fisheries everywhere should be managed under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which is very successful. Um, but but President Obama and very sadly, uh, former Senator Kerry, who as Secretary of State presided over the creation of this monument that could have had tremendous harm to the crab and and lobster industry and scallop industry, and it was only through the intervention of uh, Senator uh, Markey. You know that there was a, a seven-year carve out and then it took us three and a half years to get Donald Trump to reverse that. So I just wanted to cite those two areas. I mean, I think there were people with legitimate concerns who were harmed in some way by the past Democratic administration and they had legitimate non-racist uh, non reasons to vote for Donald Trump. Con you know, conversely, uh, if you listen to our, our Boston University alumnus, uh, alumna uh, AOC, you know, she suggested that it was very troubling 
um, that uh, that so many white people voted for for Trump. I don't think it was necessarily a 100% literally black and white issue. Now it's officially been decided that uh, Joe Biden is our president elect and Kamala Harris is our vice president elect. Um, that means Trump will, no, will not be in office in January. Uh, however, the Republican Party is, is still the Republican Party. And, and you know, some people, a lot of people will agree, including Republicans, that the Republican Party has become the party of Trump over the past four years. Um, what do you think, and you could say whether or not you agree with what I just said, uh, but what do you think is the future of the Republican Party? Is it going to look like, is it going to go back to the way it was, let's say, in the you know, George W. Bush era, or is it going to look a lot like the way it is now and continue being a sort of Trump party guided by his uh, sort of his rhetoric and, and his principles? I think Trump is the 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room. I think Trump is not going away. He's already said this week at the White House, <clears throat> he told guests uh, that he was trying to win another four years, but uh, if not, he would be back. See you in, in four years. I think that uh, the, one of the reasons that you're seeing sort of a mealy mouth approach by some of the Republican senators is that they're scared to death they're going to get uh, primaried by, by Trump. Uh, I think uh, Trump is very much um, the face of, of the Republican Party going forward, <clears throat> and um, he's he's until he steps off the stage, which may not be very soon. Jill, sure, really, there's not there's not much more to add to that. I think I think we have to see. I I, I um, it doesn't seem like he's much going anywhere, and because of the dynamic that Candy identified, I mean, we see you know all all kinds of reports that. Um, Republican senators and whatnot are congratulating Biden or sending messages through emissaries, but you know haven't publicly acknowledged or congratulated um, the president-elect and and um, their their colleague uh, Senator Harris. There's sort of a you know everything's frozen, and you know if the president does indeed um, announce that he's running for president in 2024 or even before the inauguration of Joe Biden, things may remain much the same. I, you know, as somebody who was one of the, I don't know how many uh, former uh, Republican staffers and um, uh, a number of members of Congress who signed a letter in 2016 suggesting that Donald Trump shouldn't be the nominee, I really don't see him necessarily as the 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 face of the party. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump has said a lot of very strange things over the past several years, uh, and you know, saying that he's going to run again in 2024. Who knows what 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 he might do. Um, I think a lot of Republican members of Congress have things that they would still like to see the president do as a lame duck in the next month and a half. And why would you, as a politician who wants to get things done for your district, why would you intentionally antagonize somebody who still has the power of the pen? Um, there's a lot that can be done by executive order. We saw President Obama do that. We've seen President Trump do that. So I, again, I don't think it's a moral, the moral imperative that it's been suggested. I think it's a matter of, of politics. Yeah. Hey, and just to jump, oh, just to jump in on that. You're on. Uh, you, can you hear me? Okay, great. The, the, you know, the question also is what, what, you know, how will Mitch McConnell, right, approach uh, this time period, both in the short term and the long term? I know we're going to get into Georgia, but that sort of got things in suspended animation too, right? Uh, do Democrats win enough seats to, or the, you know, the seat, the, the seats uh, campaigns needed to, uh, to tie things up, uh, but Mitch McConnell's had traditionally um, a a very amicable and warm and personal relationship uh, with Joe Biden. Uh, so you know he's he's we all know an important player in Washington, but it could be critical um, in the event uh, that 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 the president uh, chooses to run again for re-election. So uh, you know a, a lot a lot a lot to happen here uh, yet uh, in the next month or so. I actually am fairly confident and fairly optimistic in that, uh, you know, I think everybody in Washington has met Joe Biden at some point. I sat next to him on the train one time, mm -hmm. chatted with him for a long time at the 2000 Democratic Convention. Yeah. Um, you know, Joe Biden represented Delaware, the state that nearly every public company is incorporated in. Right. Uh, he was, you know, he was, he was, he was pro-business. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and, and he was a senator. And in, during the Obama years as vice president, he was frequently criticized by some of, on the far left 
for being the emissary to the Senate. So actually, I think he probably has a reasonably good relationship with Mitch McConnell. If the, yeah. if as I think is like, you know, who knows anything can happen. The day that I saw Newt Gingrich swear, uh, become speaker and then swear Sonny Bono and as a member of Congress was the day I decided anything can happen in politics. So it is possible that Georgia would elect, would send two Democrats to the Senate, but it's most likely that it's going to be a Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell dynamic. And I think that could actually work reasonably well. Well, I mean, you have to have, you have to have the Senate in order to pass legislation. I mean, Joe works very well with Mitch McConnell, but you can be sure that McConnell will do everything he can to block any Biden legislation that comes along, particularly if it's extremely progressive. So I don't expect, I don't see Joe Biden introducing a whole lot of, um, you know, very progressive legislation. He's gonna, you know, he's the art of the practical, he'll do what he can with Mitch, but you know, they've had, uh, what, 47 years? I don't know, how, I don't know how long Mitch McConnell has been there, but. Um, Joe Biden certainly knows how to work the Senate from one end to the other. Has anybody, was anybody ever sworn in younger than him? He was literally 30, as young as you can be when he became mm -hmm. a senator. Mm -hmm. I did an interview with him and uh, I remember doing an interview with him. He hadn't even been sworn in yet and uh, liked him and his family so much. They were just lovely, lovely, lovely people. And the next week uh, the accident happened and the, uh, his wife and little girl were, were killed. So you know, I was there from the beginning with him. Um, but anyway, I think um, I think the the legislation that he'll try to put through will probably he, he's going to get a lot of uh, he's got a lot of pushback from the from the left from the progressives that they have to get something done right, Jill. Um, otherwise, there's um, no hope for the future. So you think the question is, do we get Senator Biden or or do we get uh, presidential candidate Biden? Because presidential candidate Biden was far more liberal than Senator Biden ever was. I think he's he's probably he's a moderate, but uh, his agenda is the most progressive agenda, uh, even more so than Obama and um, and Clinton's. So, uh, but it's a question of how uh, being able to get it passed. Yeah, let, let's talk about the progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party a little bit, because I know that's a theme that continues to come up. And then we're going to take an audience uh, question. But, you know, one thing I want to talk about is how you all think that the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party has influenced the party in the past few years, particularly in election 2020. And I want to look specifically at what we learned from the congressional and Senate races in 2020. Um, you know, Democrats won the House by a slimmer margin than they would have liked. And the fate of who controls the Senate lies, as we know, in the two runoff elections in Georgia. So I want to ask, you know, have each of you comment on this. Do you agree more with the sort of the, the moderate Democrat and the Republican explanation for why Democrats didn't do as well in these races, which is that basically the progressive messages, of, you know, the slogan defund the police and the, the socialist labels that have been uh, have been thrown around have, have scared people away from voting for those down down ballot uh, Democratic candidates. Or do you do you um, agree with progressives um, explanation for it like AOC? who said in the New York Times that really Democrats failed to organize as effectively as, as Republicans did. And uh, she also noted that every swing seat House Democrat who endorsed Medicare for All won uh, their reelection. So there seems to be arguments on both sides. Progressives want to say that, you know, uh, they're in the right. And then those who aren't progressive point to them and say, you know, it's your fault that we didn't do as well in these races. So what, what do you all think about that? I don't agree with AOC. Um... I think it was an extremely well organized camp campaign. I mean, just texting alone. I mean, they, they, they were sending out, like you could do 50,000 texts in a day. Uh, you had these, uh, these Zoom calls. Um, you could be on a call for like $20 with thousands of people with, with Jill and, 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 um, and Joe himself. You, or you could be on a call with Bill and Hillary. Uh, for, for $20, it was a much broader grassroots outreach, a very personal campaign where, you know, you would get, you, I, I probably got, I don't know about you, Jill, but I probably got 20 emails a day. And, and it was like, dear Jill, please help us out. Or dear Candy, please help us out. I got one from Stacey today saying there's a concert. It's gonna do a big concert uh, with all kinds of really wonderful names uh, that Bob would know, but I don't. Um, but you know, for twenty dollars, and uh, so it was dear candy. I hope you'll join me in this. And so it was very, very personal. But I do think 
that the, as far as the progressive movement is concerned, had a tremendous impact on this campaign. And you would have to start, go back to the Women's March, for example, after Trump won and you had a million women lined up here. And um, I had the, I was political director at the Women's National Democratic Club. I had all the leaders of the march come. They're very progressive women and they kept that thing going. And they, that started the whole women's involvement in this, in this campaign. Um, then you had the March for Our Lives, right? And the, then you had the, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. Um, a lot of people supported that. You had, um, the, the progressives had been working on this movement for a very long time. And I, and I really do think that they had an organizational effect. Like look at Stacey Abrams, what she's been able to do in Georgia. Um, you know, she's very, very progressive. The fact that Joe Biden took Kamala on the ticket, she's one of the more progressive members of the Senate, maybe the most progressive member of the Senate, right? So um, I think they've, they've definitely had an impact. Yeah, and I'll, ju I'll just jump in there and say that, you know, the strong policy dialogue of the primary, in my view, set us up to win the general election because it forced the development of a platform, which was agreed to enthusiastically by everybody, Senator Sanders included. Um, and it engaged younger people who we saw turn out and vote for Democrats. Um, you know, it prioritized um, the climate issue, um, which has been important to our party, but not as, as, as prioritized. Um, it pushed to the fore an equality, um, a conversation about equality um, and other needed reforms um, that, that spoke to people who often do not turn out and vote. Um, it, um, it really the progressive um, leadership in AOC included really stepped up um, for the bigger picture. They organized, they spoke out, uh, and you know but the president is the president elect is going to need to um, put together um, a package um, that speaks to a lot of people in order to get things done. As as we've already described, um, there's a there's a, a a far right and a right wing of the Republican Party center, if you want to call it that, Bob, and we have a center of the Democratic Party, um, a left and a far left. Um, and and I think that President President elect uh, Biden is 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 going to move forward um, mindfully. No one is going to get everything they want, and there's going to be some things that get done um, that no that, that that makes a lot of people unhappy because um, an agenda is probably going to have to be moved. Uh, comprehensively with the politics prefigured um, for this White House to get anything done. So I'm I'm hopeful um, that the left um, that the left understands that and that um, Mitch McConnell um, will play ball in the name of progress and um, serving the people of this country because um, you know there are so many people who 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 need um, who need us to build back. Uh, better as the vice president campaigned um, on as a message and one post this pandemic. We got to slay this pandemic and we got to get the economy back on track and get our country back on track. So Chris, I think that um, AOC's interview in the New York Times was peculiar. Um, she criticized Connor Lamb for only spending $2,000 on Facebook. Well, he won actually. And as Candy pointed out, uh, I think at the presidential level, the Democratic Party did do a, a, a rather good job. Um, but I think when you go down ballot, that's when you have uh, some questions that need that need to be answered. When she said, when she her her comment about Medicare, I mean, the power of incumbency is very well known, and most of the people, the people that she cited, were incumbents. So the fact that they were incumbents uh, who, uh, you know, who, who advocated for Medicare for all and, and won, I don't know if that's a real um, a real uh, uh, barometer. But I think one of the interesting things is what happened in the down market, uh, I'm sorry, down ballot um, uh, uh, elections. I mean, Republicans gained, okay, first of all, when, um, you know, Russ Feingold said that if Democrats ever started taking dark money, uh, super PAC money, that, that, that they would lose their soul. This is back during the Obama years and the Obama White House distanced themselves from the, the super PAC that was created to help Obama. And yet in this election, um, you know, the Republicans were outspent. You know, we always used to hear about, uh, we have to get money out of politics. That used to be a, a, a mantra of, of progressive Democrats. But interestingly, in this election, uh, the Republicans were outspent uh, at the state level, according to ALEC, three to one. 
um, there was uh, just before the election, the Center for Responsive Politics said that uh, seven billion was spent by the Democrats and 3.8 billion. And yet what we ended up seeing was Republicans gained 192 state house seats. They gained 40 state Senate seats. They control majorities, both chambers in 31 of the 50 states. And um, they flipped three legislative chambers. So what I see is that there were people who found President Trump distasteful, but when they went down ballot, they voted for more conservative uh, Republican kind of ideas. And clearly, um, you know, I heard yesterday uh, that a billion dollars is expected to be spent in Georgia. But what we've clearly seen is that money doesn't necessarily buy an election. Right. I thought yeah. I could add to that, that um, I think very, it's very important to remember, as Jill agreed to, that all politics is local. Mm -hmm. And so in this- The famous Boston College alumnus used to like to say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, in this election, I think it was interesting that, very interesting, that people, that, um, that Republicans were willing to vote for Joe Biden, but then go down ballot, mm -hmm. you know, um, and um, I mean, de Democrats were willing to vote for Biden, go down ballot, and then um, uh, they were willing to vote for their local uh, electeds, um, and so that people were splitting their ticket right and left. And I think a lot of that was due to the, the again, the, the fear of the, the whole socialist, you know, Marxist, communist. I mean, every time you heard Trump, he was talking about, oh, the Democrats are, you know, they're, they're, they're going to take all your money. They're going to raise your taxes. You're not going to be able to drive your cars, going to get rid of, you know, cows and airplanes. Um, and so they were, they were willing to, to vote for Biden, but not, not not go down ticket and not, not, not go down ballot and vote for. Democrats. But I think similarly, Candy, that there were Republicans who just couldn't vote for Donald Trump and then return to their roots when they got down ballot. I think we saw both phenomena in both parties. That's what I'm right. Saying. That's what I'm saying. You said it better. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, I think it's going to take a while to unpack this, right? There's always a rush to want to tie everything up neatly in a bow um, before the end of the year. I mean, this I think what is fascinating about this election is that there was, there were there were voting groups, which are not monolithic. Some of you know some of it was by race and age. Some of it's by gender. Some of it's by income. Certainly education. You know the exits re, are are usually um, something you can you can take to the bank. Um, you know there are all kinds of questions about the exits because of the high turnout, and uh, we're going to be you know, when those actual voter files sort of start getting populated with information um, from uh, the states, um, Secretary of States, I think we're gonna be learning um, all kinds of things. And then of course there'll be, um, and there are post-election surveys out there. They've been out there, there'll be more out there. Um, I think we're gonna find, there'll be some general lessons, but there will also be, um, you know, some very state specific, um, some state specific um, occurrences here. Uh, so some of it may have been about defund the police, no question, and socialism. Um, but I think there's gonna be a much richer texture to it. Um, you know, the, the, the issue of the coronavirus and the economy, you know, those are, are factors um, that have been researched, but still um, how you look at those things in the context of where people live and what their economies are and all the rest of it uh, may show again, sort of a richer, a richer, more complex um, picture. So, at, at the end of the day, I, you know, I'm one of these people who, um, I don't think it's it's not one way or the other, which is in part um, not exactly how the question was teed up here. But for either party, if they want to be a, a majority party, um, I, I don't think it's going to be embrace, embracing the center or the left. Um, because the regions of the country are different. You know, we're now going into the redistricting period. Um, I know here in Michigan, for the first time, we'll have ungerrymandered districts. There are four or five other states in the last um, two elections that have, um, you know, passed um, laws to, to ensure that their, their districts are more fair. So, um, you know, it's just gonna be a fascinating time in politics. We wanna draw the conclusions and, and, and um, I think it's a little too early to do that. May I, if I may, may I ask, I'd like to ask the two of you a, a question while we were on that subject. Um, 
the Democrats, Candy, of course, has worked with the uh, conventions for years. The, the Democratic platform specifically backed campaign finance reform. And uh, President elect Biden said he would sign HR1, the campaign finance uh, bill, if elected. But then a year ago, he flipped and said, I'll take independent fundraising money. And interestingly, he won the nomination and is now the president elect. And the two candidates, Senator Warren, uh, and, 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 and Bernie, who said they wouldn't take it, you know, did, not, did not succeed. I'd love to know what the two of you think about this sort of 180 degree turn on campaign finance and the fact that the candidate who didn't do what the party has embraced for a long time is now the president elect. Thoughts, I Joe, Candy? Well, I mean, I, I really can't speak to Joe's position on that, the president-elect's position on that, but um, I just think that the uh, Democratic Party did a remarkable job on raising money. Um, and both sides, both sides did. In our case, it was um, the $5 donation, the $20 donation, the $50 donation, the $100, you know, and uh, you were, as I said before, you were able to be uh, with these principles in the campaign um, and, and to be much more of a part of this campaign. Um, I thought it was interesting that Trump, uh, who spent the, the Trump campaign spent, I, what, I, I can't even remember how much they raised, but you know, a billion, whatever. And they spent it all before the last month of the convention, uh, the last uh, month of the uh, campaign and didn't have much left to, to spend yeah. on, on they, TV ads. They spent 596 million. The uh, Biden spent 938 million. Yeah. At least according to the Center for Responsive Politics. Yeah. And the RNC has raised, I think, $210 million since the election. <laughs> but I guess yeah. my, my point is what we, we didn't see money winning elections necessarily, right? And so do you think that, that the campaign finance reform that has been, uh, you know, really uh, dear to the hearts of the Democratic Party for so long, does it really matter? Because we saw Joe Biden take corporate money. No. And, yeah, no. I agree it, with it, you. It doesn't matter. I mean, voters don't like money in politics, right? And they want reform, but then they don't, you know, they don't want public financing of elections. And then even generally for people who take a pledge not to take that money, voters believe they're going to get that money in some other way. They're inherently suspicious, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it's not a process message that gets carried in the media, so people don't even necessarily understand. You know, in Iowa, do they really pay attention to that? Yes. You know, can it matter? Sure. New Hampshire, yes, right. Um, but you know, for some candidates and candidacies, when you are, a, you know, a Joe Biden, um, and and um, you know, you're an older candidate and a different, more maybe you know, more moderate candidate. You know that to 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 sort of sustain yourself on on the long the long march to the nomination. That you know, un, unless you figure out how to get money in the bank or let other people get the money in the bank on your behalf, you're just you're not going to be able to hang in there with the Bernie Sanders or, or an Elizabeth Warren or whatever. Um, so I, I'm with Candy. I can't speak on behalf of the Biden campaign, but. You know, it's, it seems they made the right decision. And I think to the second part of what you said, you know, McCain Feingold and McCain was mentioned, um, you know, now there's all kinds of money um, in the system because of McCain Feingold. It is undermined in, in some measure, um, you know, the old coordinated campaigns that took place uh, for both for both parties um, and, and undermined, undermined the institutions, which is sort of another conversation that um, we could have for another day, you know, that Sure. You know, that was part of what fueled um, the energy of, of Trump's message and fuels him today, today right, is sort of an anti-institution message, um, you, know, you know, but that, you know, in my view, McCain-Feingold um, has made the problem worse, um, not better, because things are less transparent and more diffuse and harder to track. I'm with you. I, one quick thing on money and, and, and politics, and Jill, I know you do paid media I did a little digging and I, I found this fascinating. Um, if you look at how much was spent and, you know, Newt Gingrich used to say we don't spend enough um, on politics. And he used to say that we spend more money selling laundry detergent than politics. And in fact, Procter and Gamble spent more money on Pampers and Tide than we spent in this election. Uh, Samsung spent more money selling TVs 
and L'Oreal spent more money on makeup than what was spent in this election. So my inclination is that I don't think the, the money, I don't think money matters as much as, uh, as had been claimed, particularly by the Democrats in the past. Anyway. I wanna, I wanna hop in and take an audience question because we have a few here on the side. Um, let's see, Megan wants to know, do you think Kamala Harris's historic nomination played a role in this enthusiasm and turnout for election 2020? And she also wants to know, do you think that Kamala will play a, a larger role in the administration than a typical VP? Um, I think Kamala Harris, a lot of people did not like her um, and she didn't do very well in the primary. I don't think she was a, a big draw necessarily for the ticket. However, the ter I think she helped with turnout in that insofar as she's a um, sorority member, I think it's called Alpha Kappa Alpha and um, the sorority sisters of that sorority for all across the country uh, really uh, organized big time uh, for her and for, you know, members from sororities and fraternities from historic black colleges. But, um, and I think she will play a role. Actually, I do think that there are a lot of people who feel that Joe Biden, you know, is, um, he just broke his foot last week. You know, he's had two, two brain aneurysms. I mean, is he going to be with us for the whole eight years, four years? Uh, Kamala Harris may very well be the next president of the United States. So um, I think she, yeah, we're, just, we're gonna be hearing a lot more from her. Yeah, I, well, I think she's, um, you know, she's got a 51% approval rating, which is pretty good um, in this environment. I, I think, well, may, maybe that's a, a little dated, um, but the last data that I remember seeing uh, and um, that there was an, a tremendous amount of um, enthusiasm uh, how how persuasive uh, was she um, in terms of generating a Biden vote? I mean, what we know is that um, for the most part, by, vice presidential candidates, I mean, I've been involved in a lot of um, electoral um, research around the impact um, of a number two choice. Um, traditionally don't bring anything new. They, they, bring, they bring politics, um, but voters most judge um, Biden uh, in his judgment um, in, in that selection. And, and she met the bar. People do see her as someone who can function as commander in chief. Um, living where I do here in, in Michigan, doing a lot of work um, looking at, at women voters and women candidates. Um, she was really, really able to transcend um, some of the issues that are difficult for women candidates to establish themselves with. And, um, uh, you know, among um, women of, of all kinds, um, she did generate enthusiasm. Again, it, it is hard um, um, to track enthusiasm to actual hardcore data and turnout, but was essential and I believe um, will be essential um, given the data that has been available, uh, you know, to his success and was an important component of his election. That's my view. Haven't vice presidents been more uh, been more prominent in administrations, though, in, in recent years. I mean, God knows that Dick Cheney was, you know, criticized, the Bush administration was criticized for Dick Cheney having a prominent role. And at least President Obama claimed that President Biden had a prominent role. So I would expect that from the Reagan Bush, I'm sorry, yes, from the Reagan Bush once a week lunch kind of relationship, uh, we've seen a progression where the vice presidents have been much more involved. So I would expect her to be. I certainly Absolutely. Would. And and I think one of the most powerful statements made during the entire campaign was uh, Vice President Biden saying that President Obama made a commitment to him. You'll be the last one in the room. You'll be the last one I hear from. And both of them said that's the way it operated. And Joe Biden said the same thing to Kamala Harris. So I, I, do, I do expect... Um, the relationship to function that way. And in that case, um, while maybe not all things will be public and she has said that herself, she is certainly gonna be a force in this Biden administration. Laura, Laura wants to know, how much do you think uh, the Lincoln Project, how much of an impact do you think the Lincoln Project will have on the future of the GOP? Am I supposed to answer that being the only Republican? Uh, <laughs> yes. This, Go for it, Bob. This Brady uh -huh. kind of thing. Um, 
I don't know. I think there were a lot of people who felt that the Lincoln Project was comprised of people who, you know, didn't have jobs in the Trump administration and 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 uh, were were somewhat spiteful. I don't know that I entirely, you know, see that. I mean, the fellow who headed it um, uh, is Rich Galen's son. Rich worked for for Gingrich for years. You know, one of the more affable. Republicans. I think that um, I think the Lincoln Project latched on, as I said earlier, to the the sector of the Republican Party that was uncomfortable with with Donald Trump. I mean, uh, I have never been terribly comfortable with Donald Trump, um, but I did think, as I pointed out, that the Trump administration was not entirely reprehensible in its policies. I think there were policies that, like any administration, they did some good things and they did some things that weren't so good. Um, I don't know where the, the link, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I personally don't think Donald Trump is going to be as much of a force when he leaves office as, as Candy. I think that, uh, I, I expect that there will be some new faces that will emerge, but we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, the Lincoln Project clearly shows that there is a, a that, that there was a moderate, there was a strong moderate ne never Trump wing of the party. I mean, one of the the fellow who put together the letter I told you about, Andy uh, Andrew Weinstein, you know, was was on Gingrich's staff. We, he and I worked together at, at AOL. Um, there, I personally, you know, knew many people on both sides of that Trump never Trump divide. Most of the people I knew were not never Trump, but uncomfortable with him. And I think that's what the Lincoln Project tapped into. I mean, he made people uncomfortable. Obviously, I mean. The, the the tweets the 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 statements the infamous Billy Bush moment in the trailer before he was elected I mean there were a lot of things that Donald Trump did that made people uncomfortable I would say the blue blood country club wing of the party found him grating um, so I'm I'm not surprised that the Lincoln Project emerged I I don't I don't have personally a prediction for the future of the Republican Party except I expect new faces uh, to emerge and 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 uh, perhaps become more prominent than, than people expect. I think you have to bear in mind that Donald Trump got somewhere between 70 and 80 million votes, 74, maybe 74 million. He says more. Um, that's a tremendous amount of people supporting him. So I don't expect him to just, uh, you know, fade into the, uh, his next uh, television network project. I, I do think that people will turn to him in the party um, and he's frozen. The, the potential contenders for 2024. He's frozen them out already. So he is a force. You know, this is one of the, this is an area that isn't really related to what we're talking about, but I personally think part of the problem here, and I think we're seeing exactly what the founders said in the Federalist when they, when they created the Electoral College, they wanted a system that would prevent somebody from being a populist and getting into the White House through pure populism. I mean, obviously Donald Trump took his celebrity from The Apprentice and, and all the other things he's, he's been doing since the, the 80s uh, and, and used that very effectively. Uh, I personally would love to see a change made where you can't vote in a, I mean, I walked into the, I wanted to vote for my former uh, city councilor, Jack Evans, despite his problems. I walked in to the D DC voting booth where Candy and I think both vote and I pulled a democratic ballot. And I voted Democratic, and I left, and I became a Republican again. I think that's sort of ridiculous, and I think that Donald Trump tapped into that, um, and 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 took the nomination from a lot of traditional Republicans, people like Governor Kasich, former former Congressman, former Chairman of the, the Budget Committee, um, and and walked into the to the White House. So I think that um, you know he played the populist card brilliantly. We'll have to see if that has legs. Candy has a perfectly reasonable point. We'll have to see if that has legs politically moving forward. I, I want to jump in on that. Um, those are thoughtful comments and, and um, I, I, really smart. Uh, on, the, on the Lincoln Project, um, you know, John, John Weaver is somebody that um, I knew when he was working for John McCain and Steve Schmidt was another founder of the Lincoln Project. He ran Arnold's campaign and then the presidential campaign, um, the, the latter one. Uh, for John McCain. Um, he was actually campaign manager of the year for Schwarzenegger when I was for Granholm. Um, but, uh, you know, it's another one of those pieces that when things get unpacked, how, how, how did it impact things? A lot of folks would say, you know, Democrats like the ad so much that they probably weren't doing what needed to be done um, in the field with voters. 
and it did come under some some criticism. But um, what is interesting is that men who voted for Joe Biden, um, you know, a segment of men found a permission a permission structure through which to do that. Um, and some people think that the Lincoln Project um, provided that permission structure for them to do something that they wouldn't ordinarily or normally do. Um, in, in a game of inches, right? In these in these states um, where they were, where Biden didn't win by a lot, um, I think that we're going to see that that some of the messaging that came out um, of the Lincoln Project um, was really helpful um, in producing, you know, small margins um, for Biden. So another thing to unpack. Certainly, wildly creative, um, and and responsive cord. You know, ads that um, ask questions rather than telling voters what, what to think. I mean, I hope so. I'd like to see a more libertarian, former Governor Bill Weld type of Republican party emerge, but that's been my dream for 20 years, so who knows? I wanna take a moment and turn to Georgia a little bit because all eyes are on Georgia right now for their runoff Senate election for the two Senate seats. Um, you know, while you have folks like Stacey Abrams who are continuing to organize and continue uh, to encourage people to go to the polls, you know, you have some, some, some Supporters uh, are calling a boycott on the Georgia election, calling it rigged from the start. Um, uh, there has been some um, pestering of, of election and other officials in Georgia, uh, threats, lots of interference and, and things going on in Georgia. Based on how the Democrat and the Republican parties are each kind of approaching this runoff election, how do you think it's going to play out in the next month? Who is, I'm sorry, Chris, but I, I, I'm in touch with a lot of folks in the particularly the center right kind of Republican community. And I don't know of anybody saying boycott Georgia. I mean, I see them uh, saying we, we, we will we will pay anybody who can go knock on doors. We'll, we'll find a hotel room for you. We'll get you there. We need to get out the vote. So I, I haven't seen a a boycott argument. I've seen just the opposite. But I do think Georgia is going to be fascinating for a number of reasons. Uh, Stacey Abrams being one of them. I mean, she's just one of those amazing people in politics, not only for what she stands for, and what she does, but I mean, her, I don't know whether politics is her vocation or her avocation because she's, you know, a lot of, I don't know if people realize that she's got an, a, another life writing these like really interesting steamy romance novels under a pseudonym. So, you know, uh, I mean, kind of like, and I don't, I hate to compare God compare Stacey Abrams to Donald Trump, but kind of like that, she's got a, a an, in, an innate ability to communicate with people um, on a number of levels. I mean, she's a fascinating person, uh, just, just from a personality perspective. So I don't know if her success has been purely that based upon her, um, her, her, her politics. I think it's been uh, the way she's been able to use her race, the way she's been able to use her, her personality and her remarkable gift, which, we, you know, which, which, which came out in her novels. I, I want to clarify the boycott comment just to set that straight. Um, I apologize if that wasn't clear. So basically, from my understanding, it was last month, a small number of Trump supporters on the internet suggested some sort of an election boycott because they believe basically the election is rigged from the start. But Donald Trump Jr. tweeted and said, please don't boycott the election. Please go out and vote. So I think that was a sort of a small area on the internet of Trump supporters. That wasn't a widespread phenomenon that was, that was happening. But it was a conversation nonetheless that was happening on the internet. And um, you know, it, it is true that uh, President Trump has um, eroded faith in, in our democracy and in our voting system. I'm curious to think what you all think about that and what effect that's going to have going forward. Um, but, but Candy and Jill, please hop in on, on the, the question too. I, I watched the um, Sidney Powell Lynn Wood uh, rally uh, yesterday in, uh, in Georgia. And they said, the, the election is rigged, don't vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was really shocking. I thought it was really stupid. I mean, if, if you want to be stupid, we'll take it. But um, I, <laughs> I think that certainly uh, gave uh, Democrats an upper hand in this election. I think, I think you know, it's still a red state. Um, I think Jill would agree it's still a red state, but um, I think we've got a shot here. Um, I think certainly the two candidates, Luffler and, um, and Warnock, I mean, um, uh, Luffler and Purdue, uh, they're under a cloud of suspicion because of their financial dealings. I mean, um, Purdue, I think is the, is the biggest uh, um, stock trader 
in the Senate. Uh, and uh, I mean, he's made something like 2,500 trades, uh, uh, purchases of stocks in, in, in his time in office. Um, and I think also that um, Warnock is a very appealing candidate. Um, I mean, he is the head of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. He's a very smooth, um, polished speaker, uh, Martin Luther King's successor here. Uh, so I, I would say he's got more of a chance. I think we can, we can, we've got a good chance of picking up a seat. Uh, I don't know about two, um, but one, one thing that's interesting uh, is that this Saturday, there's a debate, right? Uh, Sunday, Sunday, uh, no, S Saturday, uh, Trump is going to speak. Mm -hmm. Sunday, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, but Ossoff has the whole floor to himself for the first hour of the debate because um, Purdue doesn't want to doesn't want to show up because Ossoff cleaned his clock in the first debate, so Ossoff has the whole floor to himself, um, and so that should that should be of, of help to him. And then, um, but you've got Karl Rove taking over the finance, the, the financial, you know, the, collecting the money for the for the Republicans down there. So there'll be a lot of money poured into this. So it's it's um, it's still up in the air how this is going to play out, but we. Yeah. Seats. Totally. And, 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 you know, Georgia is a red state, right? And so we've got polling. And then what do you do with the polling? How accurate is the polling? But both races, you know, you see Ossoff maybe, you know, two points ahead, roughly. Um, you can always average the polls, polls, you know, the average of polls. Um, and, and the Reverend about 3%. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's leaving where they are, you know, one to 2%. Um, that aren't decided. And so on, on some level, you know, this could be um, a turnout election, right? Not a persuasion election. And people are going to be looking under rocks and around corners to find people um, to drag them in. And it may come down to who does the better dragging, um, <laughs> um, which is not so articulate, but um, I, I think sort of encapsulates the spirit of it. You know, I, I have known Stacey Abrams for almost 10 years. Stacey Abrams is a friend of mine. Um, now I feel like Lloyd Benson, let me tell you, there are very few uh, Stacey Abrams in this world. Is my characterization um, of her fair then? What's that? I don't know her, but we're, like, but was, was my characterization fair? I think she's a remarkable personality. She is brilliant and she is kind and she is just and she is creative. You know, a lot of people kind of tilt their head when they learn that she's written these romance novels, right? Um, she is all of that in a bag of chips. And what she knew is she, she knew two things. She knew she would never be the governor of Georgia unless she expanded the electorate. But she also knew that people weren't gonna expand the electorate, if you will, um, just for the sake of doing it. That people, for, for people to have political power, they have to have something at stake. I think something, Chris, you may have mentioned um, to me before the panel, which is something I'm concerned about for our country at large. And, and when I think about electoral strategy in the Democratic Party, you know, with targeting and all the rest of it, we've become, you know, very technical and we've become um, collections of cohorts um, that we're not, we're not coalitions um, in the same way that we used to be, that the work that's being done is to getting power for power's sake. It's not necessarily, it's driven by moneyed interest, interests and in some measure, Bob, is, is, as you've mentioned, um, you know, is money important? How is it, how is it important? Um, again, that could be a whole hour long conversation, but the point of it is that Stacy has been in, in um, Georgia knitting together through her work, a coalition of people who believe something in common. And that's what her gubernatorial race was um, all about. Now, Biden didn't just get the benefit of her work. Um, I think he had something to put forward as, as a result of what we talked about um, the left and, and the center coming together um, around a, a, a package of policies um, that people could em embrace in, in a place like Georgia, um, which is pretty powerful that Joe Biden won Georgia um, without the same level of investment, perhaps in other so-called battleground states. Um, you know, the, the campaign was in there a little bit later. They had no idea they were gonna have the kind of money they did. But um, I'll just say a couple of quick things on democracy because I know we're, we're kind of up against the clock here. Um, you know, I heard David Gergen talking about who I just think is brilliant, right? And a great example of a Republican who worked in a Democratic administration, um, but also for Republican presidents. You know, if you think about the percent and polling of Republicans who think that the election was rigged, you're talking about 50 million Americans, right? 
Um, and so it, it is very concerning. It's actually not good for the Republican candidates um, that, and it was in the news a lot today, um, that it's being said, perhaps it was, I think a Trump lawyer who said, you know, everything was rigged down here. So don't vote, um, don't, you know, don't participate in this rigged system. Um, that's a bad thing for everybody. It's certainly bad for Republicans in the Georgia Senate race, but it's, it's bad. Um, I think some of the things that we saw that were good though, is the way media, the media handled their role in calling the elections, um, that, that that was very good for democracy. Um, and, and really, frankly, the investments that, that happened um, in the election so that people could participate during time of COVID, um, whether it be, you know, again, um, more election workers, um, early voting access, making sure people had absentee ballots, um, all of those things, you know, there's, there are some things to celebrate um, in, a, a around um, our democratic process and how local clerks sort of stepped up to meet the moment with very few resources, you know, still counting as best as they could and making provisions for how things changed, you know, the postal service, all of that. So, you know, I, I think that's here to stay. Um, there are gonna be people who wanna delegitimize this because um, these methods of voting um, and ram things back because they think it fits their will, but more Americans have stepped up, had the opportunity to vote and let's hope they keep doing it um, and keep clamoring for um, the reforms to make it easier. I would just jump in and say, can you hear me? Am I, am yes. Um, I would just jump in and say that in this election, I felt that there was a, a, a really tight coalition in the Democratic Party compared to 2016. I, I, were you at the Democratic convention, Jill? I mean, remember the Bernie people were holding up their signs, trying to block everything. And I mean, there was such acrimony and, and you know, it was very, very acrimonious. And this time, I think that, that the Bernie people just, you know, he, he dropped out, he, he endorsed Biden right away mm -hmm. and, um, and decided that for the, for the good of the party, we needed to work together. Yeah, and oh, absolutely. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I mean, they're, 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 earlier in the conversation, I think we both referenced that, that coming together around those ideas and the, and the platform. But I, I think it's something about the um, recyclical, right? Um, and good things have happened. Uh, but the sort of coalitions that knitted together the Republican Party, or let's call it Mitt Romney's Democratic Party, or, you know, or, or a, a lot of a, Republicans who would agree with that, Joe. Yeah. And, 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 you know, or it, it, it's, it's, I can't, I don't want to speak for your party, but in general, what we're seeing is just both parties are disintegrating and that people are acting in self-interest rather than building coalitions. So I both agree with you, Candy, and I guess was talking about something more like systemic. Um, it's just this lurching cycle to cycle um, that seems different about how both parties are functioning. In fairness, Jill, there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of Republicans who would call me a Republican in name only. So I don't know that I can speak for the Republican Party. Chris, thank you for putting this together. I just want to say that there's no. I don't think I don't think I've been honored as much as having Jill Alper say kind things about my comments being astute or appearing with Candy Stroud. I actually went and dug this out because Candy, of course, was one of the reporters who helped build CNN. There might not be a CNN without Candy and her original colleagues there. So thank you, Chris, for putting this together. And it was an honor to be here with both of you. A pleasure to be with you as well. And you too, Candy. Thank you Back so much. In good to see you again, Jill. And yeah. so good to see you again, Bob. Now that I know you're in town. Just down the street. Uh, yes, we Mark will speak. Co cocktails on the agenda, Candy. Cocktails on you? Absolutely, anytime. <laughs> hey, and how about Chris? What the heck? Building a 700 person plus network for Boston College. Amazing. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been a work in progress. It's been a good year and a half that I've been building it out, but it's because people like you are willing to step up and do events like this that we're, where that people are showing interest in and they're more engaged. So thank you to all three of you for, for, for doing this. We had tons of questions that we really couldn't get to during this, which means we need to have another one of these uh, at some point in the future. So uh, we'll definitely have to do a, a part two and probably a part three over the coming uh, months uh, as the situation uh, unfolds and we have a, a Biden presidency. But thank you again to the three of you for coming. For everybody who's here tonight, thank you so much for coming. Feel free to follow us on social media at BC Media Alumni. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, posting content, sharing alumni news and updates, hosting other exciting events. So please follow us. And um, 
that's it. Thank you all for, for coming for your time. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.